All right. Well, welcome to February. Yeah, that's right. It's already February. We are one month down. We got two months to go. Um, amazing how quickly time is flying by. But uh, today, our goal is to continue talking about volumes. And I'm actually going to show you another way of finding volumes of surface of solids of revolution. Um, still use the integral, but we're going to actually create the volumes in a slightly different way instead of by slicing, right? And that's what we've talked about so far is how we can get volume by looking at cross-sectional slices and um, adding up all of their volumes to get a total volume, all right? So um, that's my plan for today. But as always, I want to start off with any questions on homeworks. I know there are homeworks due tonight. So anything we want to look at from the homework sets? Uh, all right. Oh, wait, there they are. Uh, I was wondering, I was about to say, if there were absolutely none, that was going to be like a record. Okay, so let's see, from 2.2, I see some requests, 9, 10, 18, and 20. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. We'll go take a look at those and uh, see how they go. Okay, so number nine, we've already talked about. Um, so I, I don't know if that was on Friday. I think it was probably Friday. So um, for number nine, I'm not going to go over it again, um, but I'm going to suggest you go back and you look at the YouTube. Um, if you still have questions about it, we can talk about it uh, individually, but um, I don't want to spend our time going over this one again. Oh, I talked about number eight, Alexi. Uh, it, okay. Oh, because this one, the cross sections are semicircles. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, let's think about then if these are semicircles instead of last time they were squares. I apologize for that. Um, so how are you going to get the cross-sectional area? What's the cross-section or what's the area of a semicircle? Okay, good. So it's going to be one half pi r squared. Right, pi r squared gives you a full circle. So a semicircle is going to be one half pi r squared, which means we just need to know the radius of these semicircles. So think about the semicircles. Um, they're starting at, say, the top of this figure on this triangle or slanted line. It arcs over and then comes down over here. So the diameter would be the distance between the two blue lines. So the radius is only half of it which would be from the x-axis up to this line. So your radius is actually just going to be the function that's describing this right here. So we're going to have to break it into two, just like with the when we talked about number eight. So you should get the equation of this line, and that will be your radius for the first part. For the second part, the radius is always the same. It's always four. Um, but basically, you're just going to plug those functions in for your radius. So kind of like last time, or number eight, when we talked about that one, we took this distance and squared it. Now you're going to take half the distance, square it, and multiply it by one half pi. So the trick with any of these, when you've got a cross section, is to figure out the variables in your area, like in this case, r, figure out how to relate it back to the functions, the curves that are describing the edges. So um, in essence, what you're going to have is 1 half pi times f of x squared. So this one would integrate from 0 to 6. The integral of 1 half pi times, uh, that looks like the line y equals 2 thirds x. So it'd be 2 thirds x quantity squared. And then we'd add to it an integral from six to eight of one half pi times four squared, because that's our radius. 
So same idea as number eight. It's just since it's a different shape, different cross section, um, we're using a different formula, but it's the exact same idea. So hopefully that's a good enough of a push here for number nine, very similar to number eight. Okay, so number 10, same story, except now we've got equilateral triangles. Okay, so equilateral triangles means that whatever this distance is, that's going to be the base of the triangle, and then the other two sides have the same length. Um, so what we're going to need to know here is the area of an equilateral triangle. So I will help you out with that one because you may not have seen that before. And uh, I know trig is not the strength of a lot of you. So let's say we've got an equilateral triangle. Okay, so that means that all of these things um, are length, I'm gonna call it say B. Okay, so that's the, the base of this triangle. Well, that means I also know that this is B and this is B as well. But if I want the area, well, the area is going to be one half base times height. So I have to figure out this distance right there. But we can use the Pythagorean theorem for that. Because if we look at, say, this triangle, I'm going to get the h squared plus b over 2 squared is equal to b squared. Pythagorean theorem, right? This side is half of the base. So I want to solve this for h. Well, that's not terribly hard. If I just square, move things around, I get h squared is equal to 3 fourths b squared. So I take the square root. I get root 3 over 2 times the base. So we'll put this. Whoa. Hold on a second. Try that again. We're going to put this in here for h. So what we end up with is a equals one half b times root three over two times b, or root three over four b squared. So when it comes to our integral, we're going to integrate root 3 over 4, whatever that distance is, squared. And this is the case, again, where um, we need to do the entire length, not just the radius, right? So if we're going to call that function, say, f of x, um, we would actually integrate 2 times f of x squared. If we're going to define f of x the same way we did with the semicircles. So notice that it's exactly the same idea. We're just using a different area formula. And this is another one that you'd want to break into two pieces, the one for the line and then the other one for All right, so is that a good enough shove for eight and nine, or sorry, nine and 10? I'm gonna take silence as a yes. All right, so let's go look at, what were they, 18 and 20. Okay, so 18, suppose that R is the finite region bounded by X, X plus four, X equals zero and X equal one. Find the exact value of volume that we get by rotating this about the X axis. Okay. So let's go back to the whiteboard and draw a picture. All right, so we've got y equals x, y equals x plus 4. So here's y equals x, 
y equals x plus 4. And we're going from x equals 0 to x equal 1. So the region that we're looking at is this right here. And we're going to revolve this around the x-axis. All right, so think about one slice, what we're going to see. We're going to get a circle from that interior line. We're going to get a circle from the exterior line. So this is a washer. So if I want that cross-sectional area, it's going to be pi times the big radius squared minus pi times the little radius squared. So the big radius is determined by that outer function, which was x plus 4. The smaller radius is defined by that inner function, which is just x. So there's the cross-sectional area. You tell me the x, this is my cross-sectional area. All right, so now if we're going to find the volume, we need to add all those up. So we're going to integrate from 0 to 1. This function, dx. And I'm going to leave this one for you guys to finish off. But that one ends up just good old washer method that looks like that. All right, so are we good for 18? Or at least you know where to go with this. Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. So then let's go look at number 20. Wrap this up. All right, so 20 is another good old volume question. So it says we want to find the volume of the solid obtained by rotating this region. Um, uh, so it's y equals x to the eighth y equals 1, and we're going to rotate it about y equals 4. All right, so just like the other one, we're going to go ahead and draw the picture first. So let me just go ahead and clear this, and we'll start fresh. Okay, so we've got y equals x to the 8th. Um, x to the 8th looks a lot like x squared. It's just a bit flatter down here. So it's going to look something like that. So that's y equals x to the eighth. y equals 1, of course, is a horizontal line. And so we've got this region right here. And we're going to rotate that about the axis y equals 4. All right, so there's our picture. So now let's think about what these are going to look like. So here's going to be a typical cross section. So we're going to get a circle from the line, and then we're going to get a circle from the x to the eighth. So this is another washer method. So you're always going to get washers if there's any kind of a space between your axis of rotation and the shape itself. And so you can see that there's some space here in between. So you know that's going to create a washer. All right, so let's set this thing up. So again, the cross-sectional area, it's going to be big circle minus small circle. All right, well, let's start with the small circle. The small radius is a pretty easy because it's just going to be from 1 to 4, because it's always from 1 to 4. So that one's going to be 3. Right? That distance is 3. Now, the other radius is a little bit more difficult to get, but not terrible. So let me draw it in here. We're looking for this distance right here, right? That's big R. 
So I don't know if you remember the trick we played with this. I think we did one that was going around a vertical axis, but it's really the same kind of idea. I know that this distance is four. I know my radius is off of it by this amount. Well, that amount is my function. So that I know that R plus my function of X is equal to four. So R is gonna equal four minus my F of X. In this case, my F of X is, what was it? Y equals X to the eighth. So this is gonna be pi times four minus X to the eighth squared. So as X changes, that distance away changes. So that radius changes uh, accordingly. So then in terms of our integral, this one, we're gonna integrate from, well, not zero. We're gonna integrate from minus one to plus one. And those are the y, or the x values of those two points. If you take x to the eighth and you set it equal to one, that happens two places. X is one and X is minus one. And then we're gonna have pi times four minus X to the eighth squared plus nine pi. So uh, I would distribute that out, right? Foil it and then um, it's just power rule and you should be good to go. So really the trick to these always, it, it's, it's, it's visualizing the shape. That's why you'll see me every single time start with drawing the picture. And I always draw a cross section because it helps me see what are my smaller radii and, and the small radius and, and the big radius, it helps me find those two radii. So um, that's definitely something I strongly suggest every time you have one of these is draw the picture, especially when you're going around an axis that's not one of the coordinate axes because these are the ones that are most difficult to find the r's um, but i think i mentioned this last time that there are rules that it's always the same um, when you're going around an axis um, i just don't like to think of all the bunches of different uh, rules because i'm not a memorizer but if you're a memorizer if you like in this situation do these steps you can create basically a flow chart where you go, okay, is my axis vertical or horizontal? All right, well, if it's horizontal, is it above or below my region? Okay, and then I can do, here's how I found my radii. Like you can do it that way, but I'm not that kind of person. I draw a picture and then I can see it, so. All right, anyway, so how are we feeling about this stuff? A little bit better, I hope. And I think we took care of all the ones that people asked about. Okay, so um, like I said, today's goal is to um, look at a different way of finding these volumes um, for volumes of revolution that do not involve cross sections. Um, basically, you can take this as this is an alternative approach. It works, I mean, it's gonna do the same thing that doing slices does. Um, it's just sometimes it's a little bit easier depending upon the shape. So I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, my video here and I will meet you up at the whiteboard in just one second. All right, so volumes by slices, they work. Like they totally work. Um, it's just a matter of finding the cross-sectional areas and adding them up. It can be easier or harder depending upon the shape and, and everything, but it works. And with solids of revolution, we saw that we always got either disks, solid disks, or washers like those last couple of examples. Um, so either of them are fine. 
it's a circle. It's just pi r squared. It's just your radii. You might have more than one you have to worry about, whatever, but it's just, it's just circles. Okay, now, they're great. They work totally well. Um, but there's another way of doing this that can be a little bit easier depending upon what your shape looks like. And that's why I want to show it to you. And this is same idea, but this is going to be volumes from, um, from cylindrical shells. All right, so we should probably start with, okay, cylindrical shell. What, is it? what do I mean by that? What are we talking about? Okay, so this is exactly what it sounds like. Cylindrical, cylinders. So think Coke can, right? Something like that. And a shell, actually, if you are a gun person, um, this is exactly like a shell that you have for like a, you know, like a 22 or, you know, a little brass casing. Um, but really think of this as your can of Coke or a can of soup or any kind of a cylindrical can that you think about. All right. So it's going to be a cylinder. But it's going to be a shell. So there's going to be some thickness to this. All right, because mathematically, in the math world, a cylinder has no thickness. It's got no thickness. It's just that line, that, line, um, that curve that's extended out, right? But for a shell, it's going to have a little bit of thickness. All right, so that's why I say think of it like a can, right? You think about your Coke can. If you cut off the top and the bottom, that's a cylindrical shell. It's a cylinder and it does have thickness. It doesn't have a lot, right? But there is thickness to that aluminum can. All right, so if we're gonna talk about volumes from cylindrical shells, we should probably know how to find the volume of a cylindrical shell, all right? So let's kind of work through what that is and uh, what that looks like. All right, so first of all, let's think about the volume of a solid cylinder. Okay, so if I've got a solid cylinder, its volume, you probably remember, know how to do volumes by slices? Yeah, no, no one's excited to do that. Let's do it real quick. Um, remember how we do this for our volume. We get our cross-sectional slice, its area, and then we add it up. Well, this one, its area is always pi r. Okay, well, that's pi r squared x with bounds of zero and h, which ends up being pi r squared h. Ta-da! Something weird with my internet. I just saw you guys. You keep losing me. All right. Yeah, it's probably my internet, and I apologize. Okay, so where where did I lose you guys? Where did I freeze? I just want to make sure you're cool with where I got it. So the volume is pi r squared h, and I just derived it using integrals, using this cross-sectional area idea, right? You take a slice, its area is pi r squared, it's always pi r squared, it's constant, but I'm gonna integrate from zero to h for my height. And by doing that, you see that we get pi r squared h. 
Okay, so that's the volume of a solid cylinder. So now the question is, what about cylindrical shell? All right, well, that means we're going to remove a cylinder from the inside of this outer cylinder. All right, so for that, then, the volume of a shell That's going to be the volume of the bigger one, the outside minus the volume of the inside one. Okay, so I'm going to say that we've got a radius of big R and a radius of little r in my shell. So this is, you know, classic take away some from the total. So I've got my bigger radius giving me a volume of pi big R squared H. And I'm taking away the inner volume, which is pi little r squared H. All right, so, so far so good. Now I'm going to tweak this just a little bit. I'm going to factor out the pi H. And then I'm going to factor this. So that difference of squares factors to r plus little r, big R plus little r, times big R minus little r. Now there's a reason I did that. There's a reason I did that. Because I don't want to think of this as big radius minus small radius. I want to think about this as the change in the radius or the difference in the radius. So I'm going to call that guy delta R. So delta R is the thickness. of the shell. All right. Is that, is that all right? We're, we're cool with that? All right. And then this other one, if we think about R big R plus little r, that's kind of like, well, it's the twice the average of them, right? If you take the average, big R plus little r divided by two, that's actually twice that. So this piece, I'm going to call this two times R star where R star is the average radius of the shell. So in essence, it's the distance to exactly the middle part of our shell. It's right in the smack dab center. There's a reason I'm doing this. You'll see in just a second. OK, so that tells us then that the volume of the shell is 2 pi r star h times delta r. So basically, if you want to know the volume of a shell, Right, so the volume of the actual metal that forms your Coke can or your soup can or whatever, you'd need to know its height. You'd need to know the radius to the center of your shell. That's R star. And you'd need to know its thickness. And you just use this formula and there it is.
All right, so there's the volume of a shell, of a cylindrical shell. Yeah. And I know what you're thinking. You're still going, okay, so what the hell does this have to do with finding volumes of shapes and all that? Well, let's take a, a um, shape here and revolve it around an axis, just like we did before, so that we can get a volume of revolution. So let's do this. Let's start with a nice, easy shape. It's one we've used many times before. Let's look at the line or the curve y equals x squared. And we're going to go from 0 to 1, from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Okay. And I'm going to take this region right here. And what I want to do is I want to revolve it around the y-axis. Okay, so we're going to revolve this around the y-axis. So think about what shape we're going to see here. We're going to see something similar on this side. And so as we spin it around, it's going to look kind of like a cylinder with a bowl scooped out of it. Okay, but this is what we're going to do. Now, before, I would have drawn a cross section. And you'd see here that the cross section is a cylinder, is going to be a um, washer. And we could set it up like that. But instead, I want you to think about it this way. I'm going to make this out of cylindrical shells. So here is one of my cylindrical shells. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of this height, create a little thickness to it, and spin it around to make a cylindrical shell. Um, there's another cylindrical shell. I mean, there are lots of them. Here's another cylindrical shell. So there's the edge of my can. Spin it around. And so this one is a taller, wider can. Okay, so that's another cylindrical shell. But hopefully you can see what's going to happen here. I keep doing this. I find more and more of these cylindrical shells. So here's another one. And I start just stacking them inside of each, of each other. This is going to eventually give me the same shape. OK, it's an approximation. But it's going to become a better approximation if those shells get thinner. And I have more of them. All right, now I wish I had an example that I could show you, kind of like with Darth Vader, right? The Darth Vader I showed you last week is a really good example of here are slices that stack together to give you the shape. Um, but the best example I can think of, and, and I don't have one of these because I don't have children that age anymore. Um, does anybody remember those little stacking toys that were like, or you've seen these that look like, um, little cylinders that are multicolored that all fit together into like there's the bigger cylinder inside of it's another 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 but if you turn them upside down you can stack them taller so they look like a tower it's that same kind of idea of nesting shells inside of other shells that eventually give us our shape okay well if you can't visualize it, just trust me right now. Um, if you look at some resources online, you get some really good images. Um, I'm not much of an artist. But basically, the idea here is instead of adding slices, we're going to add cylindrical shells. So to get this volume, what we would want to do is this. We're going to integrate. And so here's our, in general, what we're going to have. We're going to integrate from A to B. But we want to integrate this thing over here. We want 2 pi r star h times delta r. All right, well, let's think about what happens. If I make it so that these things are infinitesimally thin, 
my delta R becomes a dr. So I'm going to put that on the end. All right. The H is going to be the H. It's the height of whatever our thing is. OK, now our R star, remember what R star was? It was the center of the shell, the actual center of that um, shell itself. Well, if that shell gets infinitesimally small, the center is the radius itself. So this is what we're going to integrate whenever we integrate with shells. We're going to integrate 2 pi r h. What the r is, what the h is, that's going to depend upon how we set this thing up. But we always integrate 2 pi r h. So you'll see me anytime we do shells, first thing I'll write is integral 2 pi r h. And then we'll start figuring out how to put those together. So let's look at this example again, the y equals x squared. And let's just look at one of the shells. So let's key in on the green shell. So I'm going to erase the purple and the orange, just kind of make this less cluttered. OK, but let's just think about that green shell. So we need to figure out r, h, and dr. All right, so for this one, the r is going to be this distance right here. Right, that's the radius of that shell. And the radius of that shell is just the x coordinate that we're using. Right? If I tell you this x, I'm telling you the radius. The dr, the thickness of this, is a little dx chunk. So if r is x, then dr is dx. OK, so then what about the height? What's giving us the height of this? Well, it's the function. Yeah, thanks, Alexi. It's just f of x, which would be x squared. So for this orientation, for this one specifically, what we're going to have is our volume. We'll worry about the bounds in a second. But it's going to be 2 pi x times x squared times dx. Because this was our r. This was our h. This was our dr. Right? So it's 2 pi r h. 2 pi r h. So lastly, we would need the bounds. And, and I told you we were doing this from 0 to 1. So here's what this integral is going to look like. It's integral from 0 to 1 of 2 pi x cubed. And I don't know about you, but uh, I like that one. That's pretty easy to do. So this is going to be 2 pi x to the fourth over 4, evaluated at 0 and 1. which when I plug in 1 and 0 just gives me pi over 2. So I know the volume of that shape. If I take this region and I rotate it about the y-axis, that volume is going to be pi over 2. And I got this by using cylindrical shells. Don't worry, we're going to do a few, you know, definitely do a few of these today so you can see the process. Um, but it all comes down to 2 pi r h, 2 pi r h. OK, so do I have to multiply by 2 since it's from 0 to 1? The, the multiplying by 2 is part of the formula always, no matter what our bounds are. That came from over here. So this 2 is that 2. Now, I don't know if you mean, do I need to take this answer and now multiply it by 2 again? Was that the question, or was the question, where does the original 2 come from? Yeah, I was just wondering because the bounds are from zero to one, and I was wondering if that means you have to do twice, or is it the whole cylinder is just this equation? The, the whole cylinder is this equation. OK, OK. So the fact that this was from zero to one has nothing to do with it. If we had just looked at the piece from, say, one to two, there still would have been a two in here. 
or from one half to one or whatever. The cylindrical shells, it's always two pi r h, no matter what. Okay, so that just comes from the fact it's a cylindrical shell. All right, so the volume of this thing is pi over two. Now, I want to show you that this has to be right by approaching it the way we did before with slices. Okay, so let's think about this same thing. Let's find the volume of this same shape but doing it the way we did before. So the way we did before was to do a horizontal slice. Oof, this is my last, yeah, let's bear that up a bit. Um, and so that slice would have given us a washer. So let's set that up using the washer method. So again, I'm only doing this to confirm this answer. Like once we have an answer, we don't have to do it the other way. But I want to show you that you do get the same thing. So um, we're going to integrate pi big R squared minus pi little r squared. But this one's going to be a dy because we're going in the y direction. We're still going to go from 0 to 1. The big radius is always one. We're always coming out to this guy. So pi times one squared. The little radius is the x coordinate, which would be the square root of y squared. Because we have to solve for x, right? This guy is x equals the square root of y. So this is the integral from zero to one of pi minus pi y. So if we integrate that thing, we get pi y minus pi y squared over 2, evaluated at 0 and 1. And it doesn't take much to see that that's also pi over 2. So we get the same thing either way. Either way. So both of them are perfectly valid, which then make, may start making you think, why bother with shells? If I can just do slices and slices do the same thing, why even bother with shells? And, and that's a legit question, right? Now, I know sometimes we, math teachers, like to show you, you know, like five different ways to do the same thing so that then it can turn into a, well, you just pick the one that works best for you, right? Like you, you've experienced that. Um, there is a little bit of that here where it's, I'm showing you two different ways so that you can pick from the two different methods for which one's better. And I will tell you that there are examples where shells are far superior, far superior to trying to do it um, with washers or disks. This specific example, no, they're about equivalent. I mean, look at what we had to integrate. This one we integrated two pi x cubed, easy. This one we integrated pi minus pi y, also easy, right? The calculus was really no different. Um, this first one required, or the second one, the washer method required a little more algebra, but it wasn't terrible algebra. It was like solve this thing for x, right? So in this situation, there isn't a clear advantage. But let me show you with this next one that there's definitely a clear advantage. All right, so this guy, we're going to go about the y-axis again, just like before. But this time, this is the shape that I want. Uh, let me move it over a little bit so we can actually draw it. OK, so we're going to look at the region that's bounded by the following. We're going to have y equals x squared plus 2, y equals x plus 4, and the y-axis. OK, so this is going to be our region. We'll draw a picture of it in a second. But again, we're going to rotate it 
about the y-axis. All right, so here's the region. And we're going to rotate it about the y-axis. So let's draw the region. Let's see what this looks like. So y equals x squared plus 2. All right, cool. That's just good old parabola. Looks like this. We have y equals x plus 4. OK, well, that's a line that looks like this. And y equals 0. And let me just to let's do the in the first quadrant. Because I just realized that there are two regions that are bounded by this. So if we're looking at the one that's in the first quadrant, I'm looking at this piece right here. All right, so that thing that looks like a bird wing or something like that. So before we do anything with it, are we good with the region? Y'all see it? I hope. Okay, so we're going to rotate this about the y-axis. And so the other part of this that we're going to see if we rotate it is going to be over here. Right, and you can kind of see what we're going to get. It's going to be like a little bit of a bowl with the cone thing cut out. Uh, maybe it looks like a tulip. Might be a way to kind of visualize this. But this is the shape that we're going to get. All right, so I want you to think about this real quick as a slicing idea, looking at the slices. Do you see what the issue is going to be if we do this with slices? Because there's definitely something we have to worry about if we do this with slices. Well, think about this. Down here, the slices are actually going to be disks. Out here, the slices are going to be washers. So we're going to have to do two different integrals. We'd have to do an integral where we've got just the disks, and then we'd have to do an integral where there are washers, add them both up, and deal with that. Okay. So in this case, if we were to slice it, we definitely have to use two integrals. All right, well, instead, think of it as cylindrical shells. So here's an example of one of the cylindrical shells. So there's one of them. Here's another one. And I want you to notice that the height of the cylindrical shells, while it changes, is still always being defined the same way. It's always going to be the difference in the line and the parabola. So this is one where cylindrical shells is definitely better because we can do it with just one integral. So let's do it. Let's get this thing set up. Let's do the one integral and calculate this volume. All right, so always start with the volume is equal to the integral of pi r, or sorry, 2 pi r h dr. Right? It's always 2 pi r h dr. And again, why? Because that's the definition of the volume of a cylindrical shell. We, we built that. All right, so let's just think about one of these shells, and let's think about calculating the R and the H and the DR. Okay, so the DR is a little DX thickness. 
And my R, my radius, is also going to be X. So we'll start setting this up. We're going to have 2 pi X. We're going to get DX. But now I need my height. Well, the height is going to be the difference in those two functions. So it's going to be X plus 4 minus X squared plus 2. And then lastly, I need my bounds. I need to know over what X values does this region sit. So if we look back at our original region, this thing right here, I know it's all totally cluttered. Um, it's going from zero out to this point, which is gonna be where these two intersect. Well, if you solve for that, you get that that's x equals 2. It's at the point 2, 6. So our bounds are going to be from 0 to 2. So let's see what this looks like after we do just a smidge of algebra. So I'm going to distribute my x through. Actually, no, let's do this. Let's pull the 2 pi out. So we get x times x plus 2 minus x squared. I can combine the 4 and the 2. Um, now if I distribute that x through, I get x squared plus 2x minus x cubed. And this is a really easy integral to do. So I'm going to get x cubed over 3 minus, or sorry, plus x squared minus x to the fourth over four, evaluated at zero and two. Um, plugging in zero, of course, gives me zero. Plugging in two, I get eight thirds plus four minus 16 fourths, which is four, so four minus four is zero. And so we get 16 pi over 3. So the volume of that tulipy looking thing is 16 thirds pi. And we were able to do it with one integral, and the integral wasn't that bad. It took a little bit of algebra, but not much. All right, so here's one where using the cylindrical shell method definitely better. All right, it's definitely better than doing it the other way. All right, so we've now seen two examples. So you're, hopefully you're starting to see how this works. Your dr is either going to be a dx or a dy, depending on how these shells are oriented. Our shells have been vertical each time. That meant their thickness was a dx. If instead they're lined up the other way, your thickness is going to be a dy. We'll do an example of that next. Um, but your dr is always going to either be a dx or a dy, just depending upon which way are they oriented. Right? Is that shell up and down, or is it sideways? The h, well, that one you're going to have to build. And it's going to depend upon the region itself. It's usually a difference in functions, but sometimes not. Sometimes it's just the function itself. And then the radius itself, the r, is going to be dependent on x or y, but it will also change depending upon where the axis of rotation is. So we'll do an example there as well, where we rotate about something that's not one of the coordinate axes. All right, so how about this one? Here's our next example. Let's do one that we're going around the x-axis, just so you can see how that plays out. So let's do this. Let's rotate. The region bounded by x plus y squared equals 1.
and the coordinate axes in the first quadrant Okay, so we're just going to look at the, the piece of this in the first quadrant. And let's rotate this about the x-axis. So the last two you saw we were rotating about the y-axis. Let's do this one about the x-axis. Okay, so as always, I'm going to start by drawing the picture. So x plus y squared equals 1. That's a parabola. It's a sideways parabola. We saw that for x, it's x equals 1 minus y squared. So it's a sad parabola out here at 1. So it does this. We're going to be looking at the part that's in the first quadrant bounded by the coordinate axes. So let me erase this bit and that bit. So here's our chunk. Okay, so that's the region. And we're going to rotate it about the x axis. All right, so you can imagine that this thing then comes over here. So this is what one of our cylindrical shells is going to look like. So there's our little bit of thickness. Rotate it down just like that. All right, so notice that this time our can is on its side. The first two examples I showed you, the cans were upright. This one, it's on its side. So that means that the dr is now actually going to be a dy. The thickness is in the y direction. All right, so let's start setting this thing up. So because we're doing cylindrical shells, the volume is going to be the integral of 2 pi rh dr. All right, now on our picture, let's sort of see what everything is. The H is now sideways. The R is up and down. So we're going to get 2 pi. 2 pi is always there. The radius is now a Y distance, going from 0 up to the Y of our function, 2 pi Y. And our height is actually the x coordinate. And the x is given by 1 minus y squared. And then our dr, our thickness, because it's sideways, is a dy. So that's what's going to go in this interval 2 pi r h dr. R is Y, height is 1 minus Y squared, DR is DY. So then lastly, we need the bounds on Y. So what are the bounds on Y for this region that we're looking at? Well, it started at Y equals 0. We were told we were using the coordinate axes. And then it's going to extend all the way up until we reach the Y value up here. Well, that's the intercept. Right, that's the y-intercept. So if we let x equals 0, you get y equals 1. So there's the integral that's going to give us the volume of this shape. So this is going to be 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of y minus y cubed, which is 2 pi times well, the integral of this is y squared over 2 minus y to the fourth over 4, evaluated at 0 
and one. And I believe that that also gives us pi over two. We keep running into pi over two today. Very coincidental, but uh, clearly the universe wants us to see pi over two for some reason. All right, now this isn't one that I would necessarily say um, shells is better than slices because the slices on this are pretty easy as well. If you think about the slices, uh, it's just going to be a disk. The radius of the disk is the same r, so it would be the y coordinate. Um, so that'd be one that you could integrate with respect to x. Also going to be pretty fast, but cylindrical shells, nice and quick and easy. It's all about just getting comfortable with the pictures, right? The more of these you see, the, the, the better they're going to get. All right, so let's do one more. Let's set up one more that's going about an axis other than the coordinate axis. Because if I don't show you one um, that goes off of a different axis, when you run into one in the homework, you're going to get all pissy and you're going to go, oh, you never show this one. Well, let me show you. It, it doesn't really do much other than change the R, kind of like it did when we looked at the slices. All right. So let's try this guy. Let's look at the region that's bounded by. Well, let me write this out. So we're going to rotate the region that's bounded by y equals x squared minus 2x plus 1 and y equal 1. But we're going to rotate it about the axis x equals 3. So no coordinate axis this time. We're actually going to go about x equals 3. All right. So let's start drawing this thing. So y equals x squared minus 2x plus 1 is a parabola. It's a happy parabola. Its vertex is at x equals 1, y equals 0. So it does something like this. Okay, So there's our y equals x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then we're going to put in y equals 1, which is right there. So we want the region bounded by these two curves. All right, well, that's this region right here. Okay, so that's the shape that we're gonna rotate. But we're gonna rotate it about the line x equals three. Okay, so let's set this up using cylindrical shells. So here's what one of those cylindrical shells is going to look like. There's the edge of the can going to come out here. And there's the other edge of the can. So I also always draw a representative shell because that definitely helps me visualize what's going on. All right, so there's our picture. That's what this looks like. So now let's set up our integral. 
So again, we want to integrate 2 pi r h dr. Okay, well, let me pull the 2 pi out, just we'll get it out front because it's a constant. But now let's think about r, h, and dr. All right, so let's start with the radius of the shell. So in our picture, there's our radius. Well, I know that this total distance is three. And I know that this distance right here is my generic y. So I've got r plus y equals three. So r is gonna be three minus the y coordinate. So that's what I'm gonna put in here for my r. I'm gonna put, 3 minus y. You may remember a similar trick when we calculated the radii for the slices when we were off a different axis. Same kind of idea. All right, so there's our r. Uh, we still have to calculate an h. All right, so let's just think about how we're going to get that h. That h is going to depend where we are, right? It's going to depend on y. And what it really is, is the difference in those two sides of the parabola. So to get that, we actually have to start by solving this thing for x. We need x equal since um, we're going to have things in terms of y. So let's take this guy and let's solve it for x. Um, maybe you recognize that that is x minus 1 squared. If you don't, it is. It'll make life a little bit easier for us. So we get the square root of y is equal to x minus 1, or x is equal to 1 plus the square root of y. Technically, I'll put it here. It should be a plus or minus. So we get 1 plus or minus root y. So the one on the right is 1 plus root y. The one on the left is 1 minus. So our h is going to be the difference in those. which is two square roots of y. So that's the same kind of trick that we've always played with right minus left. So it's just two root y. All right, so that's my h. And then my dr. That little thickness is a little y chunk, so it's going to be dy. So that's what we're going to be integrating. And so then the last thing we need to know are the bounds on y. What y values define that region? And again, we're going from 0 up to 1, because we were told y equals 1. So that's what this integral looks like if we're going to do it this volume by shells. So let me change it to exponential form instead of radical form. So that square root of y is y to the one half. So if I Distribute that through. I get 6y to the 1 half minus 2y to the 3 halves. So let's go ahead and integrate that. So that's going to give me 4y to the 3 halves minus 
four fifths y to the five halves evaluated at zero and one. The, the four and the four fifths, um, those come from just dividing by the new exponents using the power rule. So if I plug in the one and the zero, the one's gonna give me four minus four fifths. The zero gives me zero. And I believe that ends up being 32 pi over five. So the volume of that shape is 32 pi over five. But there you go. There's another one that we found by using cylindrical shells. Um, this one, you don't have to use cylindrical shells. Again, it's never you have to use cylindrical shells. Alternatively, we could have done the slices. The slices would have led to washers. Um, it would actually have been a pretty straightforward setup for a washer. Um, so this is one where washer method actually might have been better. This is actually very similar to one of the homework questions. I don't remember which one it was, but we had a shape that kind of looked like this. Um, so this is one where it might have been better to do washers. However, cylindrical shells, just as good. And this one's not terrible, actually. I mean, once we get it set up, once we get here, the integration itself is bending it. Right? It's not a big deal. All right, so I want you to take from this what exactly what it is. It's another way of finding volumes for surface solids of revolution. Okay, it's just it's a slightly different viewpoint, which in some circumstances will be easier. I will warn you though, you're not gonna like this. Okay? You're probably like, yeah, no shit, I don't like it right now. Okay? This isn't one that you're ever gonna like, well. You'll eventually get comfortable with it if you do it enough. Like me, I, yeah, I, I, I have no problem with cylindrical shells whatsoever. But I've been doing calculus for, oh, good Lord. I, I probably learned this in, let's see, when did I take calculus? 1980, yeah, I said 80. 1989-ish? is when I first learned cylindrical shells. And I've been doing it pretty regularly now for whatever that is, 30 plus years. So obviously I'm gonna feel good about it. You've been doing cylindrical shells for 30 plus minutes, right? So it feels weird, it, feel, it doesn't feel nearly as nice as slices. And I doubt that by the end of this quarter, you're gonna feel any better about this than slices. And that's okay. But you still need to practice it and, and use it because sometimes it's super easy. You do it with shells and it's fast. Doing it by slices takes you way longer. And the goal always with math is you want to be able to do it, right? That's number one is you got to be able to do it. But you want to do it as fast and easy as possible. You want to be lazy. And sometimes cylindrical shells is the lazy way out. All right. Anyway, so get in there, play with these on the homework, practice them. Um, they're not due until next week. So obviously you've got time to practice them. They're also not going to be on the exam this Friday. Remember our first exam is this Friday, um, but it doesn't cover this section. It covers up to the last section, which was slices, so volume by slices. Um, so you definitely need to know volume of slices for the exam. Volumes by shells, you won't need to know that until uh, for a testing thing until a quiz next week, probably. Um, anyway, so um, the last thing I just want to mention before we call it a day is don't forget there is homework due tonight. Make sure you get that done by midnight. Um, but other than that, I hope you guys have a great day, and I will see everybody on Wednesday.